and then start broadcast. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center webinar. Uh, today, we are going to be talking uh, all about large uh, vehicle technologies uh, that can be used to improve the safety of vulnerable road users. Um, in particular, our panelists are going to be sharing some information about truck side guards uh, and their ability to reduce uh, pedestrian and bicyclist injuries and fatalities. Uh, my name is Dan Jolene, and I will be facilitating today's webinar. I would like to introduce you to each of the panelists uh, that are joining us today. Uh, first, Dr. Alexander Epstein uh, is here. He's an engineering analyst in the Office of Policy, Planning, and Environment at the Volpe Center, which is the federal research lab of the U.S. Department of Transportation. In this role, he assesses the potential safety and sustainability effectiveness of advanced vehicle and fuel technologies, partnering with transportation leaders at multiple levels of government to inform the adoption of technologies that can increase traffic safety and reduce emissions. Chris Carter is the co-chair of the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics. Uh, with a background in engineering and planning, Chris has helped to lead the city's overhaul of parking technology, expanded the city's mobility options, launched a digital storytelling outfit, managed the award-winning public space invitational, and currently oversees the city's autonomous vehicle research efforts. Uh, he previously acted as the director of Boston's bicycle program and oversaw the expansion of Hubway, uh, among other roles. We're really thankful and grateful to have these panelists uh, here with us today uh, to share their expertise. Uh, and, their ex and their perspectives uh, on this important topic. I would, um, before, we, uh, before we get started with the presentations today, I'd like to go through just a few uh, housekeeping items. Uh, attendees, I'd like to ask if you can hear me, please click the hand icon located in the upper right-hand corner of your screen uh, to raise your hand. That's going to let me know that our uh, audio is working, we're coming through loud and clear to everybody. So I'm just going to take a quick look around the room and see if I can see those hands going up. Um, great. It looks like you all can hear me. Thanks so much. Glad to have you all here with us today uh, to talk about this important topic. Um, as you're um, watching the webinar, uh, for whatever reason, if your computer freezes up, I'd encourage you to please just reload the website, log back into the program, and you should be able to rejoin the session. Uh, you will, uh, should note that uh, attendees won't be able to speak during the webinar, though you will have the ability to submit questions to us uh, using the question box located in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. So um, I'd encourage you to please uh, send in those questions, send in those comments at any time. We do plan to hold about 20 to 30 minutes at the end of the presentation uh, to have a discussion with our panelists and respond to your questions. Uh, we have already posted the presentation slides um, on our website. I'll be sharing a link, uh, sending that out to you all uh, brief in, in just a moment. But you can also get there by going to pedbikeinfo.org uh, slash webinars. Um, the presentation slides uh, are already available, and we are recording the session. That uh, presentation, the, the recording of the session, should actually be up, I would say, uh, by tomorrow morning, I would, I would guess. Um, so check back then to take a look at the recording. Later today, you're all going to be receiving an email uh, from the UNC Highway Safety Research Center uh, that will contain a link that will allow you to generate a certificate of attendance uh, for the webinar. So it's important that if you're attending the webinar with multiple attendees at your site, you just want to make sure to forward that email to each of them um, so that they can also uh, get their certificate of attendance. Um, the email will contain a link to the site where we've posted the materials uh, from today's webinar. Uh, the webinar has been submitted to the American Planning Association to be considered for 1.5 uh, CM credits. So if that pertains to you, please go ahead and uh, check their website for more information about how to claim those. You can learn a lot more about our Ped Bike Info uh, PBSC webinars by visiting our website, pedbikeinfo.org. Uh, following us on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, uh, our handle is Ped Bike Info. That's another good way to stay up to date uh, with what we have going on. Um, if you want to talk about our webinar today, uh, you can use hashtag PBIC webinar if you're on social media. Uh, and then a more standard form of communication, we operate a mailing list and we send out an email every time we schedule new webinars. Uh, so for example, um, in a couple of months, we haven't scheduled them yet, but we are planning to do a two-part series on uh, safety implications uh, for bicyclists and pedestrians of uh, aut autonomous vehicle technologies and related policies that cities are working on and states are working on around those. So uh, I encourage you to stay, um, get on our mailing list or stay up to date with us on social media to learn more about what we schedule uh, those webinars. Um, I'm almost through with all my, um, all my material. I just want to do one thing and that's to launch a quick 
uh, poll. I want to find out um, a little bit more about how many people are out there today. So if you can take a quick moment and, and respond to this, we just want to find out, you know, is it just you out there <clears throat> attending the webinar? Do you have a couple of people at your desk, uh, maybe a larger group, four or five, six or seven, maybe more than eight? We're trying to get a better handle on how people are attending our webinars um, and, and how many people are actually out there. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind just casting your quick vote, uh, we'll go ahead and move uh, right along with the presentation, probably in about 10 more seconds. All right, just a few more seconds to cast your vote on the poll, and then we'll move right along. Okay, great. We're going to go ahead and close it now. Thanks, everybody, for, for casting your votes and helping us out with that. Um, we are going to go right ahead and get things kicked off with uh, Dr. Alexander Epstein. So uh, if you take a look at your screen, um, you should see the uh, control come across uh, to accept screen control. Um, we'll go ahead and accept that and go right ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, thanks, Dan. Great. And uh, here we go. So let me go ahead and make sure people can see the screen. So show screen should be on. And let me go ahead and jump here to the top. Does everyone see the uh, screen? Yep, sure do. And, and looking good? All right, let's uh, let's jump in. Is it showing up as a full screen? Um, it's actually not. I just see it in the uh, page view or in the full program view. And now? Oh, that's perfect. All right, let's go. Uh, so as, as Dan, Dan mentioned, I'm uh, Alex Epstein from the Volpe National Transportation Systems Center. I'll be doing the first part of today's uh, webinar on improving bicyclist pedestrian safety using truck side guards. Uh, those truck side guards are uh, visible in these two photos on the cover slide uh, at the left there. You, you can see actually a demo we did here at Volpe with our uh, local city fleet um, with that uh, bright bright colored yellow side guard. On the right is a, a, a photo of a test with, uh, with a bicyclist colliding with that truck and the, the red side guard is integrated into the side wall of that truck. So. Let's start out with a quick introduction today and then uh, technical considerations and some thoughts on implementing side guards as part of a larger pedestrian bicycle safety uh, strategy uh, within, your, within your jurisdictions or your, your institutions. In, in one slide, uh, Volpe, the National Transportation System Center, is a unique agency within the U.S. Department of Transportation. That's 100% fee for service. Uh, we think of ourselves as the national lab of the DOT, uh, where we perform technical research and, and analysis in all modes of transportation. Uh, and we have a total of about um, 1,100 staff here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, adjacent to MIT. Uh, and we are able to partner with quite a few different other agencies, uh, including both other parts of the federal DOT, but also with states and cities. And quite a bit of the work that we've uh, done with SideGuards has been partnerships with uh, other with, with city agencies. So I do want to acknowledge that. For example, uh, the city of Boston presenting next, New York City, San Francisco, uh, and Cambridge. Jumping into the technical considerations of SideGuards, well, this is actually not very technical, but but alludes to the problem. Uh, the problem statement uh, related to SideGuards is collisions between vulnerable road users and large trucks. And these are headlines that we see um, uh, too, too frequently uh, and reflect both the geographic scope and um, the fact that this is um, a um, particularly deadly type of collision between a large vehicle, such as a truck, with very high ground clearance, heavy weight, hard to stop, hard to see, and vulnerable road users, people walking, biking, perhaps on mopeds. Um, the statistics in terms of um, how trucks are involved in these uh, fatal and, and serious injury collisions are telling. Uh, we know that trucks comprise about 4% of all vehicles in the US uh, in terms of registered vehicle fleet. Um, but they are overrepresented in the fraction of people biking killed, people walking killed. 11% um, of bicyclist fatalities are um, attributable to, to collisions with trucks and 
7% of pedestrians. Uh, and the disproportionality is actually quite a bit larger in cities where there is more uh, walking and biking activity or in college towns, college campuses, perhaps. Uh, New York City, we know we know that one statistic is especially high there, 32%, about one third of bicyclists killed or killed by trucks and one out of eight pedestrians. Even though in New York City, the number of, uh, the fraction of, of trucks is actually slightly lower. It's 3.6% of all vehicles. Uh, so why, why is this? Um, at least uh, two, two key contributing factors uh, help explain this disproportional uh, relationship where, where trucks are, are overrepresented in VRU, vulnerable road user fatalities. One is it's hard for the driver to see. So trucks, trucks are designed with typically very large blind spots compared to smaller vehicles. Uh, and the other is underride, where underride, I'll explain in a second, means that um, instead of going over a vehicle, when a person walking or biking is hit by a, by, a, by a passenger car, typically goes over the vehicle. With a truck collision, that person would typically go under. And that, that has um, more, uh, more serious consequences. So issue one, blind spots. Um, mirrors, mirrors are part of the equation. That's for indirect vision. And, and windows or glazing on the cab are another part of the equation for direct vision, uh, but even with relatively good uh, amounts of, of window and mirror visibility, these nine bicyclists in that video uh, clip at the left, uh, it's actually still from a video clip uh, from Transport for London, um, shows that nine, nine cyclists can disappear within the blind spot of a turning truck. Um, so there, there are some serious gaps in in the visibility that can be addressed through additional mirrors, and there's certainly other systems, uh, other technologies to help uh, prevent these kinds of collisions where a truck is beginning a turn or is, is merging to the curb. Um, but here we'll be mostly talking about how do we how do we mitigate those collisions. Um, we know that uh, a surprising fraction of collisions where um, pedestrians or bicyclists are struck by trucks actually happen on the sides of the truck, uh, more so than with other types of vehicles. Uh, in fact, one out of three, roughly 32% of, of collisions, um, of these fatal collisions, start with a, a side impact. And this is uh, especially true for bicyclists. Um, so given what we know about that, uh, Volpe has researched uh, what we can describe as a uh, globally proven vehicle-based safety strategy uh, known as truck side guards, uh, illustrated in two pictures at the top. On the left, you have a truck without. On the right, you have one with the side guard where that exposed area between the axles has been covered. And uh, we know that, for example, in, in Asia, the uh, regulations have existed for side guards since uh, almost 40 years ago, and uh, in Europe, um, nearly as long. Uh, and we have some, we have data. We, we're continuing to research the topic, uh, but the high-level data is that in those side impact side impact crashes, the, the um, chance of fatality can be significantly reduced, especially for people biking, uh, but also um, um, perhaps 20% for pedestrians. Uh, and that is a, that is a serious safety gain. Uh, in those side impacts. Remember that about one out of two bicyclist fatalities involving a truck happen, uh, after, happens after a side collision. Uh, and about one out of four pedestrian fatalities start with a, with a side impact. So moving on um, to how do side guards actually look? How do they get implemented to mitigate those collisions that start with side impacts? We've uh, boiled them down into two topologies, uh, rail-style side guards on the left and panel-style side guards on the right. Uh, these are seen all over the world. Uh, we've cataloged quite a few designs. You can further uh, segment them into narrow rail, wide rail, and panel. Uh, these are all sorts of heavy-duty trucks uh, from across Europe. Uh, very similar designs you'll find in Asia and South America. 
And uh, one thing you'll notice is uh, they all have these horizontal rails. Uh, if they have rails and they're smooth from the front to the back, sometimes they are incorporated um, or aligned with other vehicle elements like uh, smooth-sided fuel tanks or refrigeration units uh, like that pink, uh, those pink trucks at the right, uh, or they have toolboxes integrated in them so that they, they also have other functions. Um, so side guard really isn't necessarily a particular, um, particular set of materials or particular set of shapes. It's, it's that flush uh, continuous coverage or continuous smooth barrier between the forwardmost wheels um, and the rear axle of a, of a truck or a trailer. In the US, uh, there, there's, no, uh, there's no federal regulation or, or um, any, uh, any mandate uh, the way there is in, in certain other countries. Um, what has been interesting is to, to see uh, bottom-up cities taking the lead on, on side guards. And this is not necessarily an exhaustive inventory. These are just the ones that, uh, that my team is aware of, the cities that, that we're aware of. And, uh, quite a few of these we've we've supported and worked with uh, on the technical aspects of figuring out how to source, how to how to install, and 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 um, and ultimately implement fleets of side guards uh, or side guard equipped trucks to help protect VRUs in these different cities. Um, and you'll see some of them are still pending. Uh, I believe Chicago is actually announcing uh, announcing theirs during this during this webinar. Uh, Volpe and cities uh, recognized quickly as, as we started working with Boston and, and New York early on in 2014 that having consistent standards or consistent specifications for side guards is important. Uh, so that this not being a, uh, at that time in 2014 a very common vehicle feature in the United States, we needed to come up with uh, these specifications. And, and what I'm showing here is a, is a snapshot of the voluntary specification that Volpe uh, put together in consultation with a number of cities and early deployments and, and published, um, uh, making it available for any institution or, or jurisdiction to reference and to use. Some of these uh, representative installations from the US are uh, before, before we came came up with and published those those voluntary specifications and some of them are after uh, but you can see there's a diversity of different designs and different approaches materials um, also again incorporating other uh, vehicle body elements like in that Seattle truck at the top left where there's a, a toolbox as well as a, a yellow panel that that fits the remaining space and that would be the only purpose-built side guard on that particular vehicle um, and you'll notice also a combination of trailers as well as straight trucks that have been uh, fitted with side guards here. So far, most of these have been uh, retrofits, but increasingly we're seeing new procurements, new, new deliveries of vehicles as they're being turned over. We're actually getting side guards from the manufacturer, just like they are uh, in, other, uh, in other markets where side guards are common and required. So we've talked a little bit about the benefits and design. I'll skip now to the other side of this. And this is this is um, something we are still actively looking into. And certainly, these are moving targets as something becomes more common. Uh, availability and cost uh, tend to improve. Uh, but really, we are starting to see some numbers that are, uh, in terms of cost, not that different from mass markets where, where side guards exist uh, everywhere. Uh, throughout Europe, for example. Uh, here are some, uh, the, the two earliest cities, Boston and New York City, that we worked with, um, had roughly in the ballpark of $1,200 to $2,000 per vehicle as, as the side yard cost. Uh, so that gives you, gives you an idea. It's about 1% about of the cost of, of a truck, typically. Uh, and have used different side yard types, different materials and designs. Uh, but as we look toward larger suppliers out of Europe or Asia, uh, those costs uh, can dip easily into the hundreds, 
so below a thousand, um, and and that's good news, um, making it making it more um, available and and easier to source um, and also easier to justify. Those are still mainly typical, typically rail style. Um, and at this point, I want to mention something that probably some of you on on the webinar are, are asking, which is, don't we already have side guards on all those tractor trailers that I see on the highway driving with them? Um, aren't those already side guards? And the answer isn't it isn't a simple no. Most of them are not, um, and probably very few of them are rigid enough to serve as side guards because a side guard does have to physically deflect a human being in a collision and sweep them out of the way instead of allowing them to go under the truck uh, and be uh, be run over. Uh, the So most of those side skirts, as you see at the right at the bottom, uh, they look a little different. They don't typically cover the entire gap. They're often uh, less structural, they're flimsy. If, if you push hard on them, they will bend. Um, at the left, you see a rail style side guard on a, on a trailer, that one's out of Japan, and it's all rail style, so there's no, no change in the aerodynamic benefit, um, which is where those uh, trailer skirts uh, are, are supposed to perform. They're supposed to reduce wind drag and save fuel and save money. Uh, that's why all the trailers on the highway are using them. But there are actually now companies that are making a, a dual purpose product, um, starting to make side skirts that are rigid enough. They're slightly engineered to be more rigid and they can actually serve as side guards. So that's, that's also pretty exciting in terms of making, the, making a business case that's not only safety but, but also um, potentially fuel payback for any vehicles that travel at higher speeds. And now I'll say a few words on uh, implementation considerations, uh, what we've been seeing uh, around the country. If you're, if you're a city, there are quite a few limitations that, that you face in implementing any kind of vehicle-based safety strategy um, to improve your, improve your, your local um, um, to, to, to reduce fatalities and injuries in, in your area, just because the jurisdiction is largely reserved by, by the federal and state levels of government. Um, certainly there are ideas, there are possibilities for partnering there. Um, but um, but I, I, think, I think once we acknowledge what local agencies cannot do as far as the general truck population, there's quite a bit more, there's a lot more optimism once you think about what you can do. This is a, um, a flyer, or, or actually it was a, it was a case study uh, put out last fall by the Vision Zero Network. Uh, Vision Zero Network is a nonprofit that coordinates um, cities that are undertaking commitments to uh, reduce and ultimately eliminate traffic fatalities uh, within, their, within their borders. And uh, this case study focused on how can cities increase the safety of large vehicles in urban areas. Came up with these five, uh, five uh, bullet points at the top right. And uh, you'll see that some of these key points are investing in proven safety equipment, such as side guards, they say, uh, establishing procurement policies that, that incentivize or require side guards. And leading by example, uh, as you do this, um, engaging, engaging industry, engaging um, nonprofits in your area. Uh, and the reason, that, one reason that this is actually a very uh, promising and, and has been shown to be an effective strategy in other areas, like like the city of London in England that has used this quite effectively, is the public sector, the the purse string of the public sector. Um, controls a significant fraction of truck fleets on the road. Uh, if you just look at class one through five, light duty, medium duty trucks, it's about 40% of all fleet trucks in the U.S. that are, um, that, uh, are um, publicly, uh, publicly owned and operated, uh, owned or operated, I should say. Uh, so there's, 
there's significant uh, opportunity there to lead by example. One of the tools for doing that, as, as it describes in, in that case study, for using procurement, using your own city fleets, agency fleets, uh, is not having a research project each time you wish to implement SciGuards, but rather being able to point to, to a uniform document, a uniform set of specifications. And that's why, um, that's why our agency uh, prepared and, and published this this uh, relatively uh, simple document, just two pages, defines the dimensional and strength requirements uh, or specifications for this um, for this technology, and uh, some guidelines and applicability. Uh, and it can and has been and is being incorporated uh, by reference into into various um, various initiatives, various policies uh, at different levels. Uh, and it's really just a technical resource that can be leveraged um, leveraged for that. And thinking thinking more broadly, uh, just how other for for an example, out of London, side guards are but one part of a safer vehicle design. Um, they've integrated it with high visibility warning signage, for example, on the cement truck, um, and it's it's one of the uh, technologies being used. There's also higher vi vision cabs and additional mirrors and some uh, detection devices. Most of those others are really about preventing collisions rather than mitigating them. So it's a combination of the two that that uh, may may result in the safest vehicle. Uh, they've, they've uh, in London, formalized that as a construction logistics and cycle safety program. It's also called the Freight Operator Recognition Scheme, and the, the two are closely intertwined. Uh, the point being that that's all driven through procurement uh, for the City of London. So it's an example of, again, leading, leading by example, requiring uh, a higher standard of, of care or higher standard of safety for um, the contractors that, that, uh, and vendors that support uh, a public agency using public dollars to improve the public good. Uh, and I, I know I mentioned Vision Zero earlier, uh, so I just wanted to tie that back uh, at a high level. What do sideguards have to do with that? And if we look at the Vision Zero idea of systematically addressing unsafe parts of the transportation system to elim eliminate traffic fatalities, that crystallized in Sweden about 20 years ago. Uh, and that's the idea has been largely exported to many U.S. cities, dozens of U.S. cities that have committed to Vision Zero. One of the three original strategies in Sweden for achieving Vision Zero was identified as improving vehicles, that middle one, improving vehicles to uh, address um, driver error, address the fact that we're all human and make mistakes, uh, and that our vehicles should make those mistakes more forgiving. Uh, and that's that's really the high level where where side guards by mitigating those uh, particularly uh, severe collisions uh, between the sides of trucks and vulnerable road users uh, can help and can also fit into that larger picture. For more information, we do have a uh, resource website that lists quite a few uh, technical resources, including that uh, voluntary specification document, the technical specification at the top right. This is a screenshot of of uh, the resource website, bulby.dot.gov slash side hyphen guards. Um, there's also quite a few research reports there you can find, uh, links to a number of a number of local initiatives that we're aware of, a uh, number of press releases and and uh, and uh, also links to other articles uh, that we that we have uh, collated. With that, I'll um, uh, put up the question slide and, and uh, look forward to, to your questions uh, later on. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, uh, Alex. And um, I, I'll just echo what you said as we uh, shift the screen over to our next panelist. Um, I'll echo 
your recommendation to check out the Volpe uh, uh, page on SideGuard. It's a lot of really good resources and further reading for those who are uh, interested in this topic. So, um, so be sure to keep uh, keep that link on your mind. I think we've got that on our webinar archive page. So, um, so you can go there to to learn more. Um, and then Chris, I am uh, I'm seeing your slide, and we are ready to go as soon as you're ready. Oh, you may still be on mute, Chris. All right, can you guys hear me now? Yes, I can. Perfect. Great. Uh, Alex, thanks for that overview and uh, uh, sort of kickoff on talking about this technology. What I'm going to spend uh, the time doing is talking about how we actually went in about implementing this here in the city of Boston. Um, but first, just a, a quick primer on what my role is here at the city. So I oversee an office called the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics. We serve as a little bit of an R&D lab for making the lives uh, for people who live in the city of Boston better. And sometimes that's through programs and policies, and sometimes it's through putting pieces of metal on the sides of trucks. Uh, this is nothing more than uh, my way of getting us back to the date in 2012 where this started, uh, we started working on this, uh, a time before fake news and, and other things. Uh, but in 2012, at the time, I was running the city's bike program. Uh, we were sort of five years into our bicycle program at that point. We were rolling out bike share uh, um, to more uh, of the sort of surrounding communities at that time and expanding probably the largest actually expansion of bike share uh, to date. And um, we were sort of beginning to implement uh, more and more bicycle lanes and facilities around the city at the same time. And what also happened that year is that we saw where we were averaging one bicycle fatality a year for the previous sort of five or six years, uh, we saw a spike. So by uh, between May of that year and August of that, or uh, September of that year, we had four cycling fatalities. Um, all but one of them were with a large truck or a bus. Uh, the, the other one was from a drunk driver on a pickup truck. Uh, and this was calling attention not, you know, uh, directly to the mayor's office, but also uh, a lot of advocates saying, what can be done? Uh, what is the city prepared to do? How do we sort of stem the tide of, of these types of crashes that are occurring on our roadways as more and more people are riding around the city? Uh, so this was uh, fall of 2012. Uh, we were beginning to have some conversations about Commonwealth Avenue, which is our major arterial, one of the sort of two big major arterials through the city. Uh, this is a snapshot of what it looked like at that point. You can see there's sort of these two uh, travel lanes. This goes right through Boston University's campus. There is a bicycle facility on one side, uh, but speeds are quite high here because the travel lanes were pretty wide. Uh, there's a downhill movement there. Um, that you know, cyclists are, are traveling probably 20 miles an hour with the speed of traffic there, but there's also a number of side streets. And the morning that uh, we were sitting in a, a hearing with city council about this issue around the four fatalities we had had, a fifth person was actually killed uh, on Commonwealth Avenue. So that previous picture was actually this intersection here. It was a right turning semi-trailer uh, that was servicing a, a CVS that's on the corner there, a drugstore, and uh, made the move from sort of the outside lane. The cyclist you know, uh, probably didn't recognize uh, that it was doing a left hand or a, a right hand turn from sort of the opposite lane uh, and collided with it. And then uh, there was a, a rollover impact there. So that solidified it for us. And we were seeing four out of the five were involving large trucks or buses. Um, over the next three years, nine out of the ten in the Boston area were, again, large vehicles. We began working with uh, the MBTA, who manages the transit system, around a couple options that we thought might be viable with them, including some driver training uh, that changed their practices. But the side crashes weren't really happening with the buses. Those were largely the trucks that we were seeing, the side impact, and uh, the fatalities that resulted from that. And it wasn't just happening in Boston. As we looked around uh, and saw the newspaper headlines and surrounding communities, I mean, this is mostly just sort of eastern and central Massachusetts. We were seeing multiple uh, side impact crashes with trucks on local roadways that people were being killed or, or seriously injured. Uh, so in 2000, 
2012, at the end of 2012, I actually met Alex uh, at a local event where we were talking about bike safety and other transportation ideas, and he gave this great presentation about how far behind we are from uh, our, our friends just across the Atlantic. And we thought, well, this seems like a great idea. Uh, why aren't we doing something here in Boston to at least try this out and see if this can help uh, stem the tide a little bit? Uh, so we took $35,000 initially from um, what at the time we called the Streetscape Innovation Fund. So we had a million dollars set aside to do new and different projects in the city of Boston. We picked 18 city-owned trucks that matched uh, a bunch of different uh, vehicle types. So our goal was to be able to experiment on as many types of vehicles as we had in our fleet. So some flatbeds, some big packers, some small packers, uh, a couple other uh, sort of vehicle types that are a little bit more obscure. And we worked with two vendors at the time to custom make these because uh, there just wasn't a vendor in North America uh, yet that was supplying off-the-shelf products that we could take advantage of. Um, at the time, it was the largest pilot in the nation, which sounds shocking because it was only uh, 18 vehicles. In it, and then next we scaled that back to 16 vehicles, but it was still the largest. Uh, and largely what we were looking for in this process was how did it impact operations? What did it mean? for the drivers of those vehicles and for the maintenance teams uh, at Central Fleet that were actually uh, making these modifications but also having to service the vehicles. And did that impact anything? Were they still able to, you know, were drivers still able to mount curbs, get into the areas they needed to get into? Uh, were the folks that were servicing the vehicles, uh, how much time did it take them to take these off, put them back on when they needed to do work underneath the vehicle? You can see here just a, snapshot of some of the different vehicle types we use. Uh, there's some of those mesh style guards hanging down, uh, and then the, in the top right corner there, the more rail, rail style guards. Uh, we probably have more of the rail guards in that initial pilot, but you can see sort of a, a bunch of different types of vehicles that we were uh, trying to address this problem through. So we were into this for about a year, and then we had uh, another fatality on our roadways. That was a side impact crash in a, a section of the city called Charlestown. Uh, again, a, a large truck and a cyclist uh, and a, another rollover crash. In, in this case, uh, the vehicle didn't even realize that they had hit and killed somebody and kept going, um, uh, not because uh, you know, they were trying to do a, a hit and run, but just that they just weren't aware. So the, the mayor uh, sort of asked us, you know, what are some ways we could think of to take the pilot that we've done uh, and quickly get it onto more trucks. And it just so happened that uh, at that time we were negotiating our waste hauling contracts and this was a fairly easy provision for us to slip into the details of that contract. I hadn't gone out to bid yet. Um, so we made it a requirement for anybody that wanted to bid on waste hauling in the city of Boston that you would need to update your vehicle to have uh, side crash protection on it. Um, and we got a lot of questions because nobody knew what that was. Uh, so we sent around pictures to folks so they could understand it. And, uh, and the folks that bid on this uh, and actually got selected for the contract worked with us over the next you know, six months to outfit their vehicles. Um, mostly at the time, they were sort of these custom uh, built units. But uh, you can see in the picture here, this is sort of that summer after those contracts went through. So the first crash we had, again, a side impact with the cyclist um, but uh, in a trash vehicle. Uh, but in this case, the, the bike got crushed, the cyclist got pushed to the curb, and there was only uh, a leg injury instead of something that could have been much, much worse. So we took that tool that we had used with the trash contracts and we said, well, what if we just apply this to every contract that the city signs? all the construction vehicles that we, uh, you know, fund to put on our roadways to rebuild our streets, what if we started making them safer? Uh, what about for uh, Boston Public Schools who has uh, meals delivered, you know, in a semi-truck, can we have that vendor also install side guards on it and make it safer as they're heading through our neighborhood streets? So uh, we put together an ordinance, it passed through City Council, and it became the first uh, in the country to, uh, to pass uh, not only side guards, but also some crossover mirror uh, um, sort of crash avoidance type technology that were also included in that. Uh, you know, the, the team at, at Volpe and mostly Alex Epstein were incredibly instrumental in helping us craft that language and model it after, uh, at the time, what we thought was sort of the, the best stuff from EU and from Australia. 
Um, and we put together something that we think was, uh, you know, pretty exciting uh, based on a, a very sort of small initial investment. So the way the ordinance is actually structured, it applies to vehicles that are over 10,000 pounds that have a city contract. It also applies to our own fleet vehicles. And we decided not to retrofit fleet beyond the pilot that we had already done, but just any new purchases of, uh, in year 2015 or newer are now equipped with the technology. It includes side guards, convex mirrors, crossover mirrors to help uh, identifying people or pedestrians or cyclists in front of the vehicles, as well as uh, decals to sort of let people know where the blind spots are on that vehicle. And Alex shared a very similar slide to this one. Um, our ordinance is actually slightly different in the ground clearance uh, level right now. So we ours is spec at 21.5. This is before the, uh, the Volpe standard was sort of announced a couple years later. Um, and what we we're actually going to go back in and do is, uh, is tweak this in the actual ordinance. So we're going through that process now to make it comply with that standard so that our surrounding communities that have adopted this, uh, Cambridge and Somerville, uh, that we're all playing uh, uh, with sort of the same rules and regulations, uh, which will make it easier for vendors. This is exactly uh, what it looks like now on our trucks. So you can see we've moved mostly towards a solid panel, although in some cases we still have rail guards. Um, the product that's here on a small packer truck is uh, built by a company out of Canada called Airflow Deflector. Um, it's uh, got two little clips on it that um, are kind of concealed with little covers, but you can lift them up and pop it off uh, in, a, in a matter of 30 seconds or so, uh, which makes it great for the Central Fleet folks. They've found this uh, easier to work with, um, although we are still uh, doing some rail work, mostly because uh, they tend to be a little bit cheaper than the panels that you see here. So in about three years uh, of our initial investment of just under $35,000, we've certified 106 trucks. Uh, actually, that should say 111 as of today. And uh, only, let's see, only 21 of those are city-owned vehicles. So you can see the actual impact that we're having on private fleets uh, and vendors for the city, right? So we're leveraging uh, our ability to do procurement to actually make our streets a little bit safer. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, it's entirely safe out there. Uh, just this past year, we had, uh, or about a year and a half ago, we had a cyclist that was killed um, not far from the Commonwealth Avenue crash, very similar, a truck turning from sort of an outside lane and cutting off a cyclist. Side impact, again, killed that way. So again, we went back to the drawing board and said, how can we actually expand this? <clears throat> the city filed a bill at the state house to make it mandatory uh, for uh, all trucks in the Commonwealth to have these. Um, and we thought that this was sort of a, a way to actually address, you know, largely the trucks that are passing through the city of Boston that aren't doing necessarily work for the city of Boston, but a way to uh, make our streets safer uh, and ensure that, that people get home at night. We started building a coalition over the past year of folks. So we have you know, some government partners uh, along with Volpe, but also our surrounding towns and communities. And we're, we're also able to leverage sort of the learning that uh, New York City has done by implementing this on a much broader scale than we have. Uh, and then great company partners who have either self-selected themselves to install things uh, or have been partners with the city as vendors and actually gone out and installed and done, you know, some of the headaches of, of learning how to do this um, in partnership with us. And also institutional partners, some of the large universities and hospitals around the city have started using their procurement tools as well as a way to make this happen. And you see here, uh, the, the person pictured here is actually with a Boston University catering truck uh, who installed side guards. His older brother was the one that was killed on Commonwealth Avenue uh, three or four years ago now. So I'll close with this. Often people ask, you know, what can we do? This uh, seems fairly simple. And uh, I try to say that it actually is really easy. Um, but the, the single barrier is just starting something. At least that's what we found. And you don't have to do 16 trucks. You can start by just equipping one vehicle uh, in your fleet. So if you have a municipal fleet, just do one truck or work with a vendor that's actually working in the city already and pay to outfit their vehicle. 
it's a it's a fairly small cost somewhere depending on the style of guard you're doing it's anywhere from 800 bucks to two thousand dollars a vehicle um, and that's a good way to start the second easiest way that we have found is that those waste hauling contracts if you if a city doesn't haul their own trash that is another point of leverage right so you're going to be contracting out that we didn't actually see uh, the cost of the contracts go up it was still a fairly competitive bid and uh, you know what, what drove that cost was more labor uh, not the actual equipment and lastly uh, the ordinance approach so you know, we found this to be incredibly useful for us. It is uh, a little bit more time intensive and it's harder to do unless you do a little bit of that, the, one of the first two things. Uh, but we've watched it work, you know, not just in Boston, but uh, across the river in Somerville as they move towards this as well in Cambridge. And uh, what we've done in the area around here is that Boston actually does the inspections and certifications for some of those other municipalities. So we, we centralize uh, some of those operations and allow those municipalities to take advantage of the, the system that we've set up here in the city. So with that, uh, I'll pass it back to, uh, to the folks down in North Carolina. Okay, Chris, thank you so much uh, for that. I think that's a great uh, sort of illustration of um, a lot of the things that Alex talked about, sort of a, an actual example from, from U.S. City. So let's get right to the some of the questions. Um, we have uh, some time, plenty of time actually, uh, for, for Q&A. So if you haven't submitted a question to us already, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, you can do it pretty easily right there in your, in your, um, in your questions uh, pod uh, in the GoToWebinar go to uh, platform. But I want to start um, by, uh, by asking, I go back to Alex, um, you know, you mentioned sort of the history of, of where these policies kind of, or where these technologies were first used uh, in some other countries, and you showed that map um, of different parts of the world that had, that had already done some of this. Can you remind the, the audience where, maybe so what some of those locations were and sort of what the overall timeline was when maybe you first saw these? I feel like I saw that um, maybe 80s or early 80s is some of the earliest ones, but can you re revisit some of that? Sure. Um. Yeah, we've. Uh, I don't think I showed a comprehensive map. Uh, there is a more comprehensive map in, in the backup slides. Uh, again, not not necessarily exhaustive, uh, and we're we're still actively actively looking into into this. But uh, the earliest we're aware of is Japan. They had a regulation back back in 1979, implemented in 1980. Uh, the UK phased phased sign guards in between 1982 and 1986, the rest of Europe 1989, and that, that there's a revised revised standard um, in 1995, I want to say, mid-90s. Interestingly, in, in, in South America, there's a number of countries, Brazil and Peru, at least. Um, uh, Peru, 2003, Brazil, 2009. Um, Something to note with Brazil, it's, it's a bit of an exception. They're, they're, they have, um, like like many other Latin American countries, but but seemingly in particular, a lot of motorized two -wheel, two wheelers, uh, mopeds, and light motorbikes. Uh, so there, uh, the sta standard for side guards is uh, stronger. Uh, it's uh, designed to protect motorcyclists as well as pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, the strength standard is uh, it's based on a five kilonewton test instead of a um, one or two kilonewton test. Right. Uh, that's the amount of force that's applied, and then and then the the amount of bending is is measured. So basically, how rigid this the, and stiff the side guard has to be. Um, and uh, yeah, there's um, there may be others. Um, I'm, I believe there may be in, in Colombia and Mexico City as well. There's just a couple of voluntary standards. There's one in Australia. Uh, so there, there's quite a bit of precedent to draw on okay. is, is really what it comes down to. Okay, great. And so you kind of, uh, you predicted one of my next questions actually with a conversation about uh, mopeds and, and motorcyclists. Um, I'm, I'm curious, you know, in, in Vision Zero programs, obviously our, our cities and our states are concerned with you know, protecting all, all road users, especially the vulnerable road users, motorcyclists tend to fall into that category. So I guess I'm curious if uh, the conversations and the things that you're doing uh, with, with side guards, um, are, are there applications in the U.S. for also looking at the uh, crashes involving large trucks and motorcyclists, or is the work primarily being done to uh, sort of stem the 
severity in, uh, of, of the bicyclist involved crashes at this point? Yeah, it's a, that's a great question. Um, I think there there may actually be two two camps, and uh, motorcyclists don't necessarily fall into either. Um, there's there, there there's the research effort we we've been doing the last several years in partnership with quite a few cities, um, and that we presented on here, as including Boston, um, which is the bi uh, people biking, people walking, uh, not necessarily a motorcycle, although. It all depends on the speed. Um, a motorcycle collision at low impact is can could be equivalent to a bicycle pedestrian uh, impact at, at much higher speed. So it's just it's just the level of effectiveness. It's not necessarily that it doesn't work if it's a pedestrian bike side guard and then a, a, a person on a moped or, or motorbike uh, crashes into it um, or, or is hit by that that truck. Um, then there there's another. Uh, uh, discussion that that exists that is very distinct, I, I think, uh, which is about stopping automobiles from going under trucks, uh, large motor, you know, motor vehicles, uh, four-wheeled vehicles, um, where now we're talking about a force that is uh, 100 times or greater. So it's a very different type of technology at that point. And, and uh, I'm not aware of, stand, uh, of standards or regulations for those out there. Uh, whereas, uh, as we just discussed, there are many examples going back almost 40 years of, of national side guard for vulnerable road user um, policies and, 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 and implementation. Implementation. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I I, um, I wanted to turn it kind of on this on this line of uh, thinking with with respect to other road users. We'll certainly get back to the conversation about uh, bicyclists, but Chris, I, you know, clearly um, sort of the impetus for, for getting this really going, this conversation starting in Boston where the crash is involving large trucks um, and, and cyclists. I, I apologize if I missed it, but did you also have any uh, documentation of, of crashes involving large trucks and pedestrians? And, and do you see the side guard as being a, a tool that, that is also addressing uh, that road user or is, is the focus primarily been on um, preventing that, that crash involving cyclists? In Boston. Yeah, uh, I'll say that, uh, well, one thing was clear when we started this is that our data on crashes was not being surfaced well and not being aggregated well between departments. So the police reports and the uh, EMS reports often didn't reference each other. There's no way to link it up. So we had a lot of work to do in understanding the data that was out there other than what was being reported in the news. And that took us uh, you know, the better part of six months to get that straightened out, but then an additional sort of two or three years to actually make it work really well. Largely, you know, although we frame this as being for both pedestrians and cyclists, I will say, you know, most of it is actually a, a cyclist first truck uh, type of crash in the city of Boston. That, that's not saying that we aren't seeing uh, pedestrians and trucks, but those tend to be front impacts and not side impact collisions, at least in the ones that we're aware of. Um, so the, the side guard is mostly focused on preventing those fatalities among cyclists. Uh, and there are other strategies that, you know, we're using for pedestrians, like the, the crossover mirrors are certainly more important. Sure. Um, and uh, we're, we're seeing, you know, we saw a spike in pedestrian fatalities last year, and most of that is due to visibility at nighttime, and it's been with uh, normal passenger vehicles. But, um, it, you know, I don't think it hurts anybody to have them on there for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess on the side of, you mentioned the data, uh, crash data quality and, and understanding the problem in the first place, Do you have you seen anything come out of this whole uh, effort to to maybe improve the, the data that you're getting out of some, some of the crashes that are occurring? I wonder if you've even got maybe um, crash types now that, that identify these crashes in particular and can tag those or flag them in some way to, to track how you're doing. Yeah, we do, and that's been part of the work on Vision Zero. So Boston launched a Vision Zero program in 2015, and uh, a lot of that was around better coordination between the Health Commission, emergency management, and um, and transportation and police. Uh, and they are able to tag the type of crash that is there, and if the vehicle has, a, if it's a truck, if it has a side guard. We haven't uh, seen many of these, actually. Uh, in fact, the, the picture that I showed is really the only documentation we have of a vehicle that we've equipped actually impacting somebody. Um, 
Uh, so in some ways, we've been fortunate that that hasn't happened, and actually our, our uh, cycles fatalities has dropped uh, pretty significantly over the past few years, although I imagine you know, uh, it only takes a couple bad things to happen for that to go up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, bringing it back, I guess, to, to Alex and then, and then uh, Chris as well, but, but we, you talked a lot about you know, costs to, to do this, but then you also mentioned you know, obviously the benefits to safety and, and maybe even some other side benefits. So we've got a lot of, a lot of questions have come in with respect to, um, you know, did you look at, at this cost or maybe this benefit? Costs in terms of, uh, Chris, this may be something you're uh, very familiar with, with uh, are there impacts when installing these uh, trucks find with uh, respect to snow clearing? Are you seeing that minimum clearance distance uh, becoming a problem if you have snow built up, uh, things like that on the, on the side of the road or when they're turning? Um, are there impacts on fuel efficiency for trucks that then maybe go on to do more long haul uh, uh, travel um, from the trucking industry standpoint? Are they are they seeing a really added cost in that respect? So I, I wonder if you both can kind of talk through some of those aside from the uh, the safety benefit, the, the severe and fatal, fatal injury benefits. Uh, what other costs and maybe other side benefits are you seeing from side guards? So Alex, I guess I'll start with you and see if you have any thoughts on those. Uh, sure. The uh, the uh, the benefits uh, outside of the safety area uh, can accrue in terms of saving uh, fuel consumption. Uh, that is, of course, dependent on on what the kind of driving is. Uh, there will be more more benefit in terms of wind drag reduction for a tractor trailer doing long haul highway speed driving than a stop-and-go um, uh, city garbage truck, um, or at least if the city garbage truck never goes 100 miles to some ref refuse transfer station. Uh, and that's that's something to consider, uh, but that there is a large category of vehicles that at some point go on the highway. So that's, um, that's a big one there. Uh, there are other possibilities for benefits uh, that can be monetized, for example, liability reduction. Uh, if, if an insurance company requires or incentivizes or otherwise begins to um, incorporate that incorporate that into policies for the insurance for, for the insureds uh, and we're aware of uh, at least one company that's done that and, and another that's that's incentivizing so so insure the, the risk management and liability angle of it um, I think is also potentially uh, significant uh, and that uh, applies whether a fleet is insured or whether a fleet is self-insured, uh, like many city agencies, because um, we, we know, for example, that New York City's liability budget for their central fleet of 30,000 vehicles is would be the third largest department by budget if it were its own department. Uh, so it's a lot of money um, for um, for. Um, for, for civil liability as well when, when crashes happen. So that's that's maybe the three key areas of, of benefit. There's some other areas where if you have an aerodynamic design, there could be other uh, benefits that are we, we don't have maybe as good a grasp on, like reduction of road spray on the vehicle for in terms of preventing other crashes, typically other vehicles crashing because they can't see or some studies about wind stability of, of trailers and large trucks and skirts potentially uh, improving the wind stability and reducing some crashes. I, I, th I think those those maybe are a different tier to think about, but uh, it really it, once you start thinking of it as as a package of benefits and not just not just strictly safety in in, in the densest downtown areas, uh, there there are other um, ways to, to to make the case as well. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, for Chris, you know, feel free, you know, weigh, weigh in on some of those benefits. But I guess I'm I'm curious to go back to that. Uh, those maybe those those things that um, that might stand out as um, uh, unforeseen obstacles. You know, the snow plowing issue. Does that become more of a big deal when you have trucks using side guards? Are they getting stuck more easily? I guess that's the idea behind that. But but I wonder if if you've come across anything. Oh, we didn't think about that when we. Uh, when we, when we went on down this road or anything related to those? 
Yeah, it's been uh, it's a good question. It's been less so on the operations piece, although uh, you know, in the in the Boston ordinance, snow plows are actually exempt from the side guard ordinance. So if you're using that vehicle for snow operations, it doesn't have to be equipped. Um, and we did that initially because we just hadn't we didn't have enough snow to test uh, yet. And we had we'd seen examples in some Canadian cities that it looked like it worked really well. Um, certainly, um, some cities in Scandinavia, but there was a little bit of trepidation from our fleet management folks to do something before we could actually test it on those particular vehicles. Now that being said, you know, the trash uh, packers are out there during snowstorms um, and we haven't heard any operational concerns from those teams and the drivers. It, you know, largely that they're, they're not driving around uh, in the middle of the blizzard, uh, but not too long after and, you know, credit to our snow ops team here in Boston who does a pretty good job of clearing the roadway. They do have, you know, 21 inches of clearance, so we have to get a lot of snow before yeah. it uh, would totally shut them down. And uh, on the weight question, you know, that hasn't really come up too much. You know, our, our packers do haul out to a waste, a waste facility that's not you know, in the city of Boston, uh, but there's not a lot of fuel efficiency going on in those vehicles to begin with. So a few extra pounds uh, on the side, uh, you know, what we've heard from vendors is that they'd rather have that than a lawsuit from a crash. Uh, that it that it ends up being much cheaper for them, both from PR but also from litigation potential. Um, in terms of things that we didn't necessarily think through, you know, and this has changed a little bit now, but uh, the vendor marketplace at the time just didn't exist for this, so we had to work with auto body shops to custom weld stuff. Um, and you know, now you've got Airflow and Tackler and a few others uh, that are because the market is there for New York City. Thank goodness that are starting to pop up that makes an off-the-shelf product easier. It still means that we have to work on with our central fleet team of actually training them to do the installs um, or work with uh, you know, certifying shops in the area for the private vendors to also do those installations. And that's, that's been a little bit of a hurdle and maybe not something that we initially thought through uh, in the rollout. Okay. And so to Alex, I guess, and, and Chris as well, but the I guess I'm, I'm hearing that primarily these are, um, the vendors are providing the, the guards, the side guards themselves, and then these are primarily retrofits onto existing trucks. But are, are any truck manufacturers actually just, are, are, they, are any of them building these into their models as a, a kind of leading the way on that front, or are they pretty much something that you retrofit onto a, an existing truck? Uh, so, so far they've been largely retrofit, but that, that did change. Um, about a year and a half ago, I want to say, uh, New York City put out RFPs for, for three new sets of, of uh, truck fleet uh, replacements and uh, required side guards and all of them. And they came back from the same major OEMs that supply the rest of the fleet and, and uh, agreed to include side guards. So those are actually going on. I've seen some of those. Uh, some, of the, some of those are the uh, trash collection vehicles, the uh, ubiquitous white garbage trucks around New York. Um, so they, they are starting to, to come in, and, and the uh, manufacturers are starting to include them. Uh, the Actually, the, the work truck show in Indianapolis last March, uh, I was there. Uh, Morgan, one of the, the largest manufacturers of box trucks, uh, about 40% of the box truck market, I believe, uh, was uh, showcasing a side, guard with, uh, a side guard offering with Tackler, where you could order one of their trucks with it um, or get, get it retrofitted later at one of their one of their distributor networks. Um, so if a major manufacturer like that is doing it, well, uh, others others may well follow. Um, there's starting to be some some manufacturer availability like that, like okay. you said. Great. And so, um, and Chris, I, I you know having having gone through the process of of getting this policy off the ground and then implemented, um, you know, quite a few questions as you might guess uh, from folks who are wondering um, initially how did that conversation go with uh, with the, the companies that, that were responsible for maybe making these uh, beyond your own your own fleets I mean what were the arguments against this that you heard and, and maybe how did you respond uh, to that I, I expect cost was a big reason why maybe somebody wouldn't just want to voluntarily start doing this but were there other um, arguments against it or, or things that you had to overcome in getting this off the ground Cost was certainly on the top of the list. Uh, maybe shortly after that was, uh, they wanted some clarity as to what the standard was. You know, we had kind of written it into an ordinance, um, 
but they wanted it distilled in a very easy way uh, that they could take somewhere and make sure that they were in compliance. They, just, they were like, look, if this is going to happen, we just want to do it, but we want to get it right. And the city was a little bit slow on sort of helping them along with that process. So, you know, there's a piece around sort of marketing and messaging and working, again, with those auto body shops in advance to make sure that there's people out there that can do this work that seem to be pretty important to them. I'll say the, the other piece that came up um, was being able to access various pieces of equipment. So for some trucks, there were hydraulics or uh, other levers or brake lines that they didn't want to cover up. Um, and they felt pretty strongly about that. So, you know, the retrofits, it's a little bit tricky. You, each vehicle is a little bit different, and they wanted to make sure that they were in compliance but also still have access to all those things. So it required uh, quite a bit from our inspectional services team to work, sort of travel out to their uh, facilities and look at trucks and say, yeah, if you did this, you could get it, you know, we would, we would pass it, but not if you do that kind of thing. Uh, so there's a, a little bit of back and forth there. But by and large, you know, they were, they were excited that we were doing something. They just wanted to make sure that they were doing it right and, and yeah, okay, to get it over with as quickly as possible uh, was sort of the general. Say at the state level, when we presented this, there's been a little bit of more pushback from some uh, of the larger sort of trucking entities in the state. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, it's out there. Certainly um, there are folks that are concerned about cost or, uh, or potential liability if, they if it gets installed improperly or something like that. Sure, absolutely. That's, that that kind of gets at one of my next questions, I guess, is uh, back to Alex. Uh, you know, you, you showed the the list of all the cities that are kind of working on this now and either have policies or working on them. But I'm curious how things uh, are, are moving, if things are moving in the same direction at the state level and if there are any particular states that may be leading the, the charge on this uh, to, to kind of regulate this at a, state, at a statewide level. Yeah, I, I'm sure Chris can speak to that uh, actually. Uh, I'm aware of in uh, the District of Columbia there was a um, there was um, a, uh, an act passed or, or local law passed in last summer, uh, last summer fall, and that will require um, all trucks registered in the district starting 2019 to install side guards. Um, there's also a requirement there for crossover mirrors, I believe, starting next year. It's kind of a phased-in approach. Um, and the district is technically both a city and a state, uh, so that would be an example. Um, and Chris, maybe you can speak more to other examples. Yeah, uh, so the city of Boston has worked with our local delegation to submit a bill in, uh, I guess it was 2016. Um, we're in the process of actually uh, submitting a second bill that will actually have a hearing tomorrow, um, again, for applying it at the state level, but giving uh, more of the, uh, I think where we sort of went wrong the first time was sort of mandating something as opposed to giving a little bit more oversight to um, the State Department of Transportation to come up with some of the rules and regs and how they would think about implementing it. Mm -hmm. um, so we're hoping that that goes forward. We certainly had conversations with lots of other cities and uh, through NACTO and through the Vision Zero Network it's been something that cities have really been uh, excited about and leading the charge on as so much of the bike, bike and uh, pedestrian safety work has been. Um, we did hear, you know, in our first round of the state bill some concerns about interstate commerce clause, uh, but uh, that was largely sort of put to rest fairly quickly from some uh, constitutional law um, professors over at Harvard that were very helpful. Excellent. And then so, so uh, even scaling it up to a, to a higher level, I wonder if uh, either of you are familiar with, with whether or not this conversation is happening nationally with respect to maybe uh, uh, NHTSA and, and uh, vehicle standards, safety standards, that uh, whatever regulations might be in play there. Uh, is this, has this conversation taken place? Is there any talk of, of doing something uh, at, a, at a federal level? Alex, do you want to take that or do you want me to talk about our experience there? <laughs> yeah, go, go ahead, Chris. So, <laughs> uh, I'll save Alex the awkwardness as he, he works for a federal agency. Uh, so. Our perspective has been that NHTSA is interested in this, and we've had some conversations about it, but the timeline it's going to take them to actually do anything seems like it's going to be pretty far off, and that they're, you know, they're putting their limited resources that they have 
for uh, research into connected and automated vehicles uh, because they see the biggest potential safety gains there. Uh, you know, if you look at how rear underride has gone, it's taken them decades to uh, make a rule on that. Um, so side underride seems like it could probably be further off. If I uh, was going to opine about the federal government in general, you know, we passed gay marriage in Massachusetts a long time ago, and we're, we're, we're waiting quite a long time at the federal level for that to happen. So. Uh, I think, you know, the, the pace that needs to happen, uh, and not that local government is fast by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but there is certainly, if we're talking about saving lives and we have a technology that we're able to do it and it's relatively low cost, uh, we weren't going to wait for the federal government and we don't really, you know, our, our, our sort of message to other cities is, uh, is go for it uh, and don't wait either and let's just share our learning amongst ourselves and hopefully eventually there'll be enough of us to push the federal level that uh, it'll happen. Well, and I think that, you know, you're seeing that in a lot of areas, right, with with NACTO kind of showing what can be done with more innovative designs and, and kind of it takes, you know, some cities to be first and kind of set that example. So I guess I'm uh, transitioning from that. I wonder, you know, you have got a lot of cities doing this now um, where there are fairly high numbers of, uh, of bicyclists and, and maybe a, a lot of crashes that have been occurring um, involving large trucks. I wonder if there's any effort underway to do some higher level, uh, and maybe Alex, you, you may have mentioned this, or you're at least probably involved, but uh, doing some research to show maybe uh, safety effectiveness um, in terms of looking at crashes, and or maybe not even crashes, but conflicts that, that might be have been abated uh, in cities that have done this work. I, I wonder what that uh, would look like if there can be a research project that comes out of this. Sorry, that, I think that broke up a little bit. Can you repeat the last part of the sure, question? Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm wondering about the uh, feasibility. You know, we're, I guess I'll, I'll frame it this way. We um, often are trying to look for opportunities to quantify the safety effectiveness of countermeasures, safety uh, designs that, that are intended to improve uh, pedestrian and bicyclist safety. It can be often difficult to get the, the numbers of sites and the number of crashes you need to develop a, a good crash modification factor. But I'm wondering if there's opportunity with so many cities doing this now uh, to do some research like that to maybe demonstrate a crash effect of of, um, of doing these technologies, or is it maybe uh, too difficult with with just using? It's not a fixed countermeasure. It kind of these countermeasures move around the city. So I wonder how you would do a study like that. But could you speak about maybe possibility of, of that kind of research? Yeah, that's thanks for thanks for raising that possibility. Um, uh, at Volby, my, my team is working actually with. Um, with another federal agency um, to further study side guards potential um, in terms of their their benefits and costs. One, one of the parts of the project is to uh, be able to support a technology demonstration. Uh, and in that task, uh, we would be looking for partners. Uh, we would be looking for partners to uh, implement side guards and, and probably uh, maintain some some data collection or, or share some existing crash data collection once um, before and after uh, a larger scale implementation um, or it might be an implementation that's already underway and then we could provide some analysis for that. Uh, it's, it's fairly open-ended right now. Uh, that's happening in the next 12 to 18 months. So definitely looking to identify partners uh, on the sooner side uh, if there are cities or, or other jurisdictions that are thinking about or are in the process of implementing uh, and um, either looking for assistance with data collection or or, um, or looking for uh, some analysis, uh, we may be able to, to partner there, and I, I would definitely appreciate hearing from them. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great plug for anybody on, on the webinar who might be in that position. Uh, you know, Alex's email is right there on the screen. so. Um, follow up if, if that if you might be able to work on something like that. I think that that just speaks to the the ability of you know kind of the research community to, to maybe help in this way and then get more uh, highlight the examples that uh, of what cities are doing and demonstrate effectiveness so that that calculation of cost benefit that argument for doing this can be um, maybe bolstered by by actually being able to demonstrate what uh, you might get out of it um, by by doing by doing this. So. Um, and that's really valuable. Uh, there were several questions, you know, obviously what we're talking about here are technologies that can, when these crashes do occur, they can um, reduce the severity of the crash outcome. But I wonder beyond this area, and maybe I'll ask Chris, uh, 
you know, are, are there steps you're taking um, within the city, uh, maybe through driver, truck driver training or requirements in that area, kind of educating and, and raising awareness uh, to kind of help prevent the crash in the first place on the on the driver's side? Um, is that an area where you started to look with, with your Vision Zero program? Yeah, uh, we've done a little bit of work on driver training with uh, with our trash contractors. Um, there was some interest there. So uh, the, the team that um, handles bicycle uh, and pedestrian planning for the city has worked with those drivers uh, over the years. Um, we certainly worked with our, you know, the, the transportation department uh, that manages all the trains and buses uh, in the Boston area, the MBTA, on driver training there, uh, along with some of our community partners, whether that's um, Mass Bike or Liverpool Streets Alliance or Boston Cyclist Union to make that, uh, so in some cases, training videos. I, you know, I think largely our Vision Zero work, we've done a range of different things that don't necessarily directly relate to large vehicles, um, but we are starting to look into uh, urban deliveries and a few other things as well that uh, we're, we're noticing that that might be a good leverage point for us to shift the vehicle type potentially that's on our roadways uh, during certain hours of the day. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that actually because one of my follow-up questions, I, I wondered about policies that um, uh, that maybe did more to, to say, uh, yeah, I seem to recall an example from New York City where they, they uh, had a policy that shifted um, times for deliveries to maybe off-peak times to maybe minimize the conflicts between freight uh, vehicles and, and pedestrians and bicyclists. But I wonder if uh, that is something you're looking at too, kind of shifting when those deliveries happen so that you're, you're just kind of eliminating the opportunity for that conflict um, from periods where bicyclists may be more on the road um, during the day. We are, and we're, uh, well, we're starting to, I should say. Uh, we, we've watched what New York did with some of their pilots, whether it was uh, you know, drop-off lockers or additional staff during certain hours of off-peak time. Um, we've actually been talking with Alex and his team at Volpe and some other cities around the country via NACTO about looking into this topic as well. You know, I, I think uh, a lot of us that have been doing this work here in the city of Boston see a, an 18-wheeler making a delivery to Dunkin' Donuts or something during the middle of the day, uh, and it, it seems crazy that we allow that vehicle type even on a, a roadway with, uh, you know, a high amount of pedestrian and bicyclist traffic. So I think we're looking at ways, whether it's shifting those delivery times or uh, working with companies uh, and an infrastructure and some policies to shift the type of vehicles that's actually making those deliveries in dense urban areas as well. Great. And uh, Alex, I guess the same question to you. Are you seeing other uh, cities maybe in, do things with the, the sidecar technologies and other truck vehicle technologies, but then kind of broaden that out and say, what other policy, what other policies can we um, can we enact that that might also address this issue, but maybe from a different angle? So things like the delivery times and, uh, and and those sorts of things. I wonder if you've seen those examples elsewhere. Yeah, uh, as part of a more comprehensive program, uh, I, I think it's it's overseas, so it's maybe it's cheating, but but I I tend to come back to the London example, uh, partly because they also have constraints where they just, um, yes, they have some, some more tools in their toolkit, like the congestion zone and being able to fine trucks that don't have certain safety equipment or that that are, are dirty trucks that don't meet emission standards um, but otherwise uh, also face many constraints about what vehicles go in and out mm -hmm. um, and they've, they've been using um, quite a bit of uh, outreach to industry uh, quite a bit of uh, I'd say packaging and, and branding of information but also sponsoring research into um, you know which which devices work. Um, partnering with a university on on the blind spot analysis of typical trucks that drive on London's roads. Um, so that's that's an example there. Uh, yeah, our uh, off hours delivery is certainly an example here. There there are also restriction zones like in Seattle or New Orleans based on truck size during certain hours or certain days of the week. Um, so there, there's any number of those that you can think of. There's generally vehicle right sizing. Um, smaller the vehicle, generally the smaller the blind spots on that vehicle. Um, uh, using more cab over designs, uh, certain in general cab over designs can have 
smaller blind spots than conventional cab ones that have the large hood in front. So cities don't necessarily have the ability to say to company X, do this, but they can require it in a, you know, through their vendor contracts. And that's something that, for example, Boston does. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Alex, to, uh, another question for you. Um, you shared a slide uh, that, that included a number of different um, large uh, truck and vehicle technologies that um, can, can be used to um, maybe improve, uh, improve safety by you know, avoiding crashes to begin with or, or, or uh, preventing or improving severity level. So you, in addition to side guards, there were the windshield designs, uh, the, the uh, mirrors that, that uh, can further look out into those blind spots. Uh, maybe rear-facing cameras. I think I remember on that slide uh, of the spectrum of of those technologies that you lay out there. Uh, looking at the cities in the U.S. that are doing work in these areas, is there a particular technology that's sort of um, kind of uh, gaining more traction in terms of its uptake? Is side are the side guards the the real thing that you see being uh, most prevalent, or uh, are, are some of these other things? Uh, it seems to me, from my perspective, that the side guard. As a retrofit, it probably is something, uh, and maybe the, the mirrors as well, those are probably the easiest to get um, um, into, into use, and maybe the other ones are, are further behind. Can you comment on maybe where those stand in relation to one another, if you have any sense of that? Uh, yes, if it sounds like uh, you're asking which ones are, are commonly implemented and uh, more mature, perhaps, and sure. being, yeah. being adopted. Um, yeah, side guards and mirrors are well on their way. They're they're highly mature technology. Uh, you're seeing more backup cameras, um, even on large trucks. Um, there are some other alert systems. Those are generally generally not near not not as far along. Uh, you've got let's see uh, automatic braking is still largely um, an optional and not very commonly available feature on. On large trucks, as far as I understand, although uh, increasingly common on light duty, mm -hmm. so you're going to see more more automobiles with uh, automatic automatic emergency braking. That's something that's fairly easy just to to spec in uh, when available. Um, in in Europe, it's interesting to note know that uh, automatic emergency braking is actually required on trucks and still being phased in um, on large trucks um, for um, which is really for forward collisions for the most part. Um, I think uh, it's important to note one thing, though, that distinguishes side guards um, and, and automatic braking to some degree. Uh, the crash mitigation technologies don't necessarily require any driver training or any change to the way the vehicle is operated, whereas crash avoidance technologies, some of them, like mirrors or uh, Fresnel lenses or cameras can. Um, so just just thinking about that as well, kind of the second order implications of okay, we want to adopt a technology. Uh, then what is required to do that? One of the biggest barriers can be driver driver retraining or potentially labor issues if if there's more effort required to, to operate something after you install it. Um, or driver distraction and fatigue if there's too many inputs, okay. whereas uh, side guard doesn't uh, doesn't really change the uh, the way the driver does anything. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that's a great point. I wouldn't have thought of those additional sort of added costs in that cost column for for some of those things. So. Um, yeah. O, o and M. You can say operation maintenance. Uh, New York City's a uh, fleet fleet uh, director put it uh, in a way that that I like. Uh, that side guards are set it and forget it. Right, right. <laughs> um, so, Chris, I want to turn back to you. And, and a lot of the folks on our on the webinar are probably coming from uh, maybe their uh, transportation engineers or planners, uh, kind of looking at uh, dealing more probably with roadway design, uh, countermeasures, those sorts of things, um, and, and the physical um, roadway environment itself. So, I'm wondering, as part of Boston's Vision Zero, clearly there are, there's work being done in a number of areas. One of which is probably you know kind of looking at your roadway design and maybe installing different treatments. Uh, so I'm, I guess my question is, with the topic of large trucks and safety with, for cyclists, do you see particular designs or countermeasures that you all are beginning to use uh, that 
that can also help address this issue uh, of, of safety between cyclists and large trucks uh, in particular. And I guess the one that maybe comes to mind for me is um, something like a, a protected intersection where you're maybe increasing that distance where a truck can be turning, where a cyclist has time and has kind of uh, moved off to the side and there's a little bit out of protection to uh, prepare for that conflict. Uh, so I guess things like that, are you seeing some of the countermeasures you're using uh, kind of responding to these issues as well? Yeah, certainly. And I don't think it's specifically just the large trucks, but reducing those conflicts uh, with between vehicles and cyclists and pedestrians. You know, the team uh, that manages Vision Zero uh, has been looking into this for the you know, past couple of years. We are going, we're doing uh, a number of protected intersections. I'm actually a redesign of that roadway that I showed, Commonwealth Avenue, where that fatality was way back uh, in 2012. Uh, that whole roadway is... <clears throat> Uh, removing the, the parking on both sides and putting in a protected bike lane uh, and then the, the parking will go back sort of uh, but shrinking down the roadway and in each of those intersections is, is a protected intersection designed to uh, again provide more time um, for both drivers and cyclists to make that decision and also make those um, the sort of uh, angle that you're viewing each other at uh, more favorable to recognizing and stopping uh, you know, we joke about this, but the you know one of the ways to do this is just eliminate all turns in the city, um, would save probably a number of lives every year. But obviously, we're not going to be able to do that. But we're certainly thinking about it, uh, also in the context of autonomous vehicles, about what we do with left turns uh, and unmitigated left turns that you know right now the technology has a hard time adapting to uh, without you know some sort of uh, left turn pocket and priority type signal. Obviously, that adds. Um, you know, a time to the signal phasing in an intersection, but those type of things potentially, you know, that and pedestrian lead outs and other things, uh, you know, are pretty good uh, things to have in the toolkit for improving uh, particularly intersections and turning movements uh, yeah. with large trucks. The, the VisionZeroBoston.org website has um, a pretty good review of, of the work we've done over the last year and some of that's in there as well. Right. And so I, I wanted to wrap up, I, uh, this is, it's a bit of a deviation from the, from the topic we're covering now, but um, you mentioned autonomous vehicles and, and the work you're doing in that area. I, I just wonder if there's anything uh, that you can take from your experience in, in moving this uh, policy along for, for the side guard technology that you're maybe applying now and in, in looking at uh, autonomous vehicle research and maybe a policy that will help the city uh, you know, understand how, how, that, how those vehicles will, will begin to impact safety. Uh, any, any parallels there, any connections that you're, that you're beginning to see? Uh, you know, I think the approach is similar. I, we're not too sure about the policies yet, but uh, it's very much, you know, the approach we're taking here with AVs in Boston is to partner and experiment, and that's no different from how we rolled out side guards, right? We looked for an opportunity to partner with somebody, uh, and then we said that the best way to do this is to learn by doing, uh, and then we'll make some sort of, you know, whether it's regulation or law or ordinance or, uh, you know, guidance at that point once we know more. So I think that's where we are right now. We're sort of in, that, in the learning phase along with a lot of other cities and states around the country. Um, and that's been a pretty good uh, approach so far. I think we, we've learned a lot from our partnerships on AVs. Uh, you know, small things like that they struggle with seagulls in the roadway uh, to uh, larger questions about, you know, uh, ethics of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, yeah, I, huge issue that we'll we'll have to we'll have to tackle that in another webinar, I, I guess. And we uh, we're we're out of time now, but I, I want to thank you both. That was a great um, discussion period, and we had we had plenty of time for questions, and and your presentations were excellent as well. So just a big thank you uh, to to both of you for for participating in this webinar. Um, I would like to just do a, a remind a couple the audience of a couple of things. Uh, one, you are going to be receiving that email later today with a link to the webinar archive materials. Uh, the certificate of attendance, and a few other pieces of information. Um, I want to let you know that as you exit the webinar today, a brief survey will appear, um, uh, and we would really appreciate you taking time to provide your feedback and your, and your comments to us to let us know um, what you thought about today's presentation. And I just wanted to uh, say again thank you to Dr. Alexander Epstein and, and Chris Carter for delivering today's presentations, uh, and thanks to all of you uh, for attending today's PBIC webinar, and I hope you all have a great day.